In addition to talking to some of the movers and shakers in the Congressional Progressive Caucus, we also caught up with some leading activists like Alicia Garza, co-founder of Black Lives Matter. It is not going to be sufficient for us to uh, just think that getting a new president in the White House and then giving power back to the Democrats is what is going to make this country better. Um, it will stop the bleeding for a little bit, but um, there is hemorrhaging happening here. I knew that Donald Trump was going to get elected and I had no illusions about that. And the reason I had no illusions about that was because while some of us were talking about populism on the left, the right was building a populist movement that won power in this country. And I have never been mistaken uh, that this is bigger than Donald Trump. This is about a, um, a deep schism that has widened uh, to the point where uh, there has to be a different way of moving forward. We actually have to articulate who we are again. I don't think this is a fight between Democrats and Republicans. I don't think this is a fight between the left and the right. I think this is a fight for um, the moral center of this project that we're trying to build together. I do not think that we can just work harder and things are gonna change. I don't think that if we change who's in the White House, things are gonna change. There is so much damage that has been done um, that we are in a very different moment. And to undo the damage that has been done is going to take us at least a decade. But to be honest, things were not great before this administration took power. And so what we actually have to heal right now is people's um, complete disgust with government and its inability to meet the needs of its citizens. Um, and we also have to figure out how we solve some of the biggest problems facing America and how we do it together and how we do it in ways that um, I don't think we've really imagined yet. How do you connect your work around Black Lives Matter and police violence and the carceral state and this other work that you're talking about mm -hmm. around healing and elections and, yeah. and dealing with trauma? It's all one and the same. So uh, when Black Lives Matter first emerged, uh, it emerged around issues of state sanctioned violence, the most visible of which was police violence. And we would constantly say state violence takes many, many forms. It's not just about policing, but policing is the thing that we're all paying attention to because it's being captured on cell phones around the world. The state uses violence to contain and control, to quell the resistance that inequality generates. Uh, I was, you know, off on a trip and I was reading about rolling blackouts that were happening uh, in the richest city in the nation, right? How is it that in the San Francisco Bay Area, the home of venture capital and tech capital, that people could be without power? And that is because of the increasing control of corporations over our government and the increasing relinquish that our government gives to corporations to do whatever they want and to line their pockets and to not regulate them. All of these things are related. This deep level of economic insecurity, this deep level of material insecurity, and the rebellion that rises from that, um, state violence is used as, an, as a way to control and contain that. And if they have to kill you, they will. And do we believe it that what's at stake here are our lives? What's at stake right now? Um, is our actual futures. Like, the progress of the problems that are plaguing this country have accelerated since this administration took power. Um, and what's really at stake is not just the issues that I care about, but my ability to be able to make decisions over my life and the people I care about and the people I love. And I'm not willing to give that up without a fight. Mia Ives-Ruble was one of the organizers of the 2016 Women's March, a disability justice activist who thinks a lot about ableism in the current context and the need to integrate disability consciousness into all that progressives do. We, we identify as progressives. We see ourselves as people of color and we also see ourselves as disabled people of color. And we want to see our politicians addressing the issues that not only just align with you know healthcare and education, which is what we always hear when people are talking about disabled people. We also want to hear about issues of police brutality. We want to hear about immigration. We want to hear 
um, about transportation issues. We want to hear like a wide span of issues that really affect us but have never been addressed. So I think, you know, one big thing is just, you know, getting politicians to recognize that we are a voting population and that we are an important voting block um, because we are 25% of the population and that's a huge percentage to be ignoring. And we're, we're also seeing some of our peers who are being shot by police because they call for mental health care, uh, mental health uh, help. And so I think what we want to see is politicians really getting a grasp on that. And I think uh, we've, we've begun picking and, and, and getting more politicians to start noticing us. And I think that's going to be a big, big, big thing um, as we continue on in the 2020. How's the Trump threat connected to the rest of your work? You know, I think people don't realize that all of these oppressions all coalesce and interconnect with each other. How ableism is part of white supremacy and the belief that there is a better or superior race, right? Um, and I believe that you can look throughout history and look at like when did we start identifying issues around disability? And that was around the time of understanding how the economy worked um, and how uh, there was an importance put on work. And I think understanding how um, people have been disenfranchised um, from being able to obtain work and people choosing who belongs in society and who doesn't, there becomes this fascination and this tie of like, are you human enough? And are you worthy enough to be called human and, and deserving of, of a presence in society um, when you're looking at disability? And then you, you add on an issue of race and you add on all of these other issues. Um, it's all tied in together on who, who is worthwhile in, in talking about who deserves what in society. So is it just about getting Trump out of the White House? No, no. If we get somebody like, say, Joe Biden, or we get somebody who, who isn't, you know, you know, just wants to go back to sort of what we have had in the past, are people going to still stick up for us? You know, like people, kids were getting, being, I mean, people were getting caged long before President Trump came into office. And, and there wasn't a lot of outcry. You know, like people like Obama continued policies that were, were hurtful to a lot of communities. And so I think there is a big fear that people just are so focused on Trump that they're not looking at like a, a lot of these societal structures that have continued these issues. And yeah, sure, Trump has sort of used that as a way to, to get what he wants. But if we don't demolish those systems and rebuild something new, we're just going to run back into the same issue and we'll have somebody 10, 15 years from now doing the same exact things caging people.